Uh, well, nowadays I feel that email is done with. And, uh, and, and it's so, time so, for something so, new. Okay. Well, actually, right, and and you have all these uh, HTTP-based uh, message, uh, uh, you know, systems. Uh, Facebook is sending messages yes. into intranet network, well, they and they don't care about this MTP Twitter or is sending or tweets and right, and, and, and Google is, sending, is talking about know. Google Wave, right? Mm -hmm. And right. So, so I, that is. Is is that the reason why you're here? I, I was telling Leonardo, what what's the evil plan? Why is Vin Surf in Mexico? Well, <laughs> is, it, is it is it to do with this? This is really more a policy visit than anything else. Okay. I mean, I've been meeting with very senior people in your administration, including the president. Uh -huh. I met with a collection of senators. I met with the telecommunications sec uh, secretariat. Spoke to at least a hundred people who come from various secretariats about internet and what it's doing and where it's going and everything else. But I was mostly focusing on policy that would uh, cause more internet access to happen here in Mexico. Right. Because the current uh, access penetration is still pretty limited. Right. So that was my primary uh, reason for being here. I'm here also because I'm representing Google. Absolutely right. And we're very interested in having people know about us and the things that we're trying to accomplish and the Services. ideas that we're sharing. Fair enough. Okay. I, uh, but how about the, you know, like these kind of new services? Do you think that they may replace email as we know them today? You know, it's really hard to say because email has been around for a really long time. People still use it a lot. Right. Some people prefer find it too slow. There's a certain younger population that really prefers very rapid interaction. The twittering and tweets are, are examples of that. The iChats and things like that. Uh, I have a theory, which might be wrong, that um, a lot of people, when they are just beginning to use the network and they're young, are interacting with people who are not very far away geographically. This is not counting games and things like that. So um, it makes sense to have almost real-time interactions because everybody's in the same time zone. Right. But when you get older and your friends start to move away, they go to college, they get jobs, then they're not necessarily in the same time zone. And getting a tweet at three o'clock in the morning really is, you know, not terribly important because you're not likely to look at it until yeah. you know four hours later, which is no better than email. So I'm tempted to think that email won't exactly disappear. On the other hand, Google Wave is trying to combine all of the various modes of interaction into one tool, mm -hmm. and it's, as you know, released very early in its cycle. It's definitely beta, and we don't know yet what the side effect is of combining what would normally be very ephemeral interactions, you know, a, a brief uh, a chat kind of exchange, which happens to end up on somebody's blog because there was a blog that's involved in the wave. Right. And now the blog is going to get indexed by Google, we're going to crawl through it, and then suddenly your little tweet becomes part of an archive. And so this ephemeral thing that you said in passing suddenly becomes part of the historical record. You probably didn't plan that. So I'm just guessing that we're going to experience some unusual things like that as we explore the uses of WAVE. And it will inform us about the way we should configure it in order to be most convenient for everybody. I, I actually I uh, never thought about it. You're absolutely right. There is a temporal difference uh, that yeah, might this, inhibit this, this real time communication. Here. This, there's a principle at work here. It's called the principle of least astonishment. <laughs> but, <laughs> that what you don't want is for somebody to be astonished that something they thought was a very quick real-time interaction turns out to be in some archive. And 30 years later, when you're looking yeah. for a job and somebody says, does a little Google search, and this thing pops up about this stupid thing you said in a tweet, 15 years ago, and your reaction to that is, well, gee, I didn't know that was still there. <laughs> right. Uh, the, the way I used to see, or the way, the way I, I, I kind of see it and why I'm in Mexico has to do with, actually it's because of Google. Um, well, I, hope, that, I in, hope that's a good thing. Yeah. Right. Uh, in, in the fact that Google doesn't care if your results are in Estonia or if they are in Francisco. That's, that's right. And we the don't. only differencing factor between results is languages. So I see, uh, I think the, there's uh, 400 million people uh, let's say browsing mm -hmm. in English, uh, some 200 or so in Mandarin, and some 180 or 150 in Spanish. 
Uh, I'm, I'm actually I'm surprised that the number is that low, but I guess that's part of the penetration rate. No. Because the number to, of, of to Spanish agree. language speakers in the world is much bigger than that. Uh, isn't right. It? Uh, well, uh, not to mention the people that actually speak English. Uh, in I mean, speak Spanish, live in the U.S. Yes. Um, and you also have to be a little bit aware about penetration numbers because the penetration rate in Mexico is low, that's but right. uh, there are more people browsing there. There are people in Chile, which is the darling of South America. Yeah, it is. Boy, that's interesting. I didn't know that. So, okay. so but, then, but absolute populations have a lot to do with this. Like China. China has 1.5 billion people and 350 million of them are online on the internet. Right. Yeah. Wow. So, uh, so I, I never considered time. Well, in your talk, you were, you were saying about you know, the despair even between countries and their internet penetration, right? That's right. It's very different. Yes, although what you saw there were very gross statistics of yeah, regions. Yeah. But you're absolutely right on a country by country basis. It's dramatic. It's dramatic, right? Uh, your talks with senior people here in Mexico had to do with that a bit? Well, they had largely to do with the penetration rate in Mexico and the question of what to do about it. And part of the message was that you should try to do something about that. The internet can be very useful for a lot of people, improving GDP and everything else. But I also wanted to emphasize that you don't have to have high penetration in country X in order to make use of other countries' high penetration. Right. So if you're interested in tourism or if you're interested in exports, uh, you can make use of the fact that the U.S. has 75% penetration and target messages to that audience because they are heavily penetrated. It's still relevant, right? Yeah, so it doesn't matter how many people are penetrated domestically if your audience is out there. Yeah. So you start thinking about, well, where do I know that the Internet is heavily used? What can I sell them? How can I advertise? How can I engage with that cohort? Right. Of targets. So, so can I ask you a, just a small political question? Yeah. In your opinion, how uh, committed is the Mexican uh, government towards uh, openness and neutrality and penetration, increasing penetration, right. and so, to, towards the internet in general? So, this is a hard question for me to answer because I haven't had a consistent opportunity to go and talk to the different parts of the uh, Mexican government, including the law enforcement part. Right. So um, I don't have a, um, let's say, a factual basis to have an opinion. I can tell you that in the, mes the meetings that I've had in the last couple of days, I sense a great willingness and interest to try out new ideas, to think away from the traditional ways of dealing with things. And I found that very Drastic. refreshing. Like more drastic than the ways well, to address Well, drastic maybe, that would be one way to put it. Uh, maybe, for example, the normal way of dealing with spectrum is to auction it off. That's the traditional thing that governments do. On the other hand, there have been cases where people have made uh, spectrum available at no charge and on license, like the 802.11 Wi-Fi band. Right. Um, so it's possible to choose to do something different like doing licensed or unlicensed uh, or unregistered access to uh, the spectrum in the expectation that the users of that spectrum will generate revenues, create new businesses, grow the GDP, and produce tax revenue. Mm -hmm. So I, th I sensed a willingness to explore ideas that are not conventional in order to get to the point where it was possible to get better penetration of internet in, uh, in Mexico. Uh, so, okay. One last thing I would like you to add is, uh, have you ever sat and thought about what would be a world without the internet? Well, remember, I grew up, parties. I don't have to think about it. I grew well, you, up you, in that world. Well, <laughs> I was, well for today, I, I was, mean. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> I was 40 years old before we actually got to roll out the internet in January of 83. Mm, right. And I remember being grumpy about this because I was meeting eight-year-old kids who were doing their, you know, HTML or XML web pages. And I thought, that's not fair. <laughs> uh, you know, this kid gets to use the internet at age eight, and my buddies and I had to invent it first before we could even use it. Right. So I wish I was eight years old again so I could see what's going ha <clears throat> to happen in about 50 years' time. Fair Unfortunately, unless I uh, get in a spaceship and do the faster than light trick, <laughs> yeah, right. I won't, or, or fast as light trick, I won't be able to do that. I think you need a twin for that. But I think, if, I know what it's like to be uh, without access to the internet. When you lose power, communications goes away. And I get very uncomfortable and nervous about it because I turn to the network so frequently for information, for email, for chatting, and other kinds of uh, applications that when I don't have it, I really feel disabled. And I would argue that a lot of people feel that way.